Chapter 15 Mahdism on the March Sixty years ago, General Gordon died in the Sudan, and all England was agog as the dreaded Mahdi, religious leader of seven million people and a million square miles, threatened to sweep all Africa and the East clear of foreign rule. Mohammed Ahmed, taking advantage of certain traditional prophecies about the rightly guided one, who was to free Islam and lead the faithful to final victory over the world, raised the standard of rebellion against Egypt in the 1880s. Muhammad Ali, the Great of Egypt, a man driven by a burning desire to see his country strong, revived the age-old dream of a greater Egypt, stretching from the Mediterranean to the equator and a new pharaonic dynasty. Some Sudanese objected to Egyptian troops in their country. Britain was dragged in as a rather less than willing participant, hence Gordon and Kitchener's expedition which seemed utterly to have crushed the power of Mahdism. The Mahdi was dead, his family and literally tens of thousands of his followers perished on the battlefield at Omdurman. Even the corpse of the leader, on the best possible advice, was dismembered and thrown into the White Nile. The era of the Anglo-Egyptian condominium had come. One thing prevented the complete destruction of the militant dervish creed, a delicate boy of ten, small for his age, fleeing southwards beyond Khartoum, was spared execution by Kitchener's men. Too young, they said. There had been enough bloodletting. Surely enough mangled corpses in their patched dervish cloaks, proud emirs and henchmen of the caliph, had met their doom. The destruction, if not the rout, of the Sudanese world conquerors designate was complete. Enough had already been written about that campaign, and I was more interested in that boy of ten. Today that man is a multimillionaire whose every word rings throughout a territory one-third the size of all Europe, from the equatorial jungles to the deserts of the Red Sea shore. I left Port Sudan by air-conditioned train, travelling day and night for twenty-two hours through what seemed to deserve the name of illimitable wastes, if anything did. Hour after hour the khaki panorama hardly changed, the most that one could see was desert, stunted acacia trees, sometimes a cluster of huts which showed a small village or station. We were getting deep into Mardi land and close to Khartoum itself, the capital at the junction of the Twin Niles. Whenever we stopped at a station, signs in Arabic and English would tell us, Throwing coins or food to Sudanese is encouraging beggary and lessening self-respect. Nobody seemed to bother much about it, though, and tiny appealing figures would politely hold out coloured baskets for sale. A hundred yards away, the concrete beehive huts where the locals lived would be momentarily crowded by reserved elders, watching to see what luck their offspring were having with the passengers. They seemed to have plenty of luck. A railway official in the same carriage told an amusing thing about these beehives. The railway authorities, he said, were at one time disturbed by the fact that mud and straw huts had been declared unhygienic and dangerous. As the railway is one of the all-powerful organisations here, they immediately decided upon action. The traditional type of hut was measured, weighed, surveyed, and duplicated in hygienic concrete. These beehives were then built and exchanged with the locals for their own unhealthy homes, which were demolished and burnt. The Sudanese obediently moved in. After one day, they discovered that the huts were absolute infernos inside. They seemed to let the heat in and did not cool rapidly enough at night. So they took fresh daub and wattle and started new little villages at a respectful distance from the awful railway ovens, which were now known as English hells. Theoretically, said my friend, everyone is now happy. The official dwellings of the people are concrete huts. Their goats are supposed to live in the wattle huts. Only the goats probably feel that even the nights are getting warmer these days as they are led into concrete houses at sunset. I had a date with the son of the Mahdi, Sir Syed Abdur Rahman El Mahdi Pasha, to his followers the lawful successor of the Prophet on Earth. As our train drew in to Khartoum station, a small deputation from the Daira administration of the Mahdi whisked me off the train into a large car and towards the glittering lights of the city itself. 
This first impression of Khartoum in the velvety African evening stands out in the memory with some force. Modern Khartoum, as I was soon to realise, is a town planned and built entirely from scratch on the flat open plain, which is all that was left when the Mahdists took down every ancient building and ferried them stone by stone across the river to build their own capital of Omdurman. The result is that there is nothing sordid about Khartoum. The streets are wide and well lit. Broad avenues of elephant bean trees run from one end of the place to the other. A little outside the actual centre of the city, on the road to Omdurman, lies the vast mass of the Governor-General's palace. The car ran past this building, parallel with the Nile, and came to a halt outside a huge hotel, standing in more grass than I had seen since I left Europe. If you want anything, please ask. You are to pay for nothing. You are the guest of the Madia, I was told. There was nothing oriental about this place, and very little African either, for that matter. Here we were on not only European soil, as it were, but seemed actually in Britain. Englishmen with white tuxedos and red or black cummerbunds sipped their cocktails in the palm court. Vivacious groups of British colonial civil servant types drank in the cool air and chattered on the terrace. But here, as everywhere in the Sudan, there is no colour bar and about a quarter of the guests were dressed in the flowing white gowns of the Mahdi community. But all was not well in the Sudan. According to the Egyptians, Britain was running the country as a colony and supporting the militant Mahdists. Egypt, they said, was not getting a fair share in the ruling of the condominium. Pro-Egyptians were being discriminated against. Propaganda was being carried out against the unity of the Nile Valley some sort of unification of Egypt and the Sudan. Moreover, Egypt was not getting enough water, and the Sudan could cut off the supply when she wanted to. Control of the waters at this point, where the Niles meet, should be supervised by the country which could literally be burned up if the flow were to stop. The followers of the Mahdi said that this was all nonsense, and that the Egyptians merely feared Mahdism because Sasayed could become the king of an independent Sudan. They pointed to the racial and historical differences between the Egyptian and Sudanese people. The British had not much to say. They felt that they needed most of their energies in the administration of the country. The other great Sudanese politico-religious group, the Marganites, were against anything that was for Mahdism. Then there are the southern tribes, where men still worship trees and use razor blades for currency. Many of the equatorial tribesmen are, however, Christians, and missionaries wanted to know if they were to be left to the mercy of the Muslim majority. The pagans and the Muslims complained that the South Sudanese had been at the mercy of the missionaries for long enough, and so it went on. I went to see Sir Syed to get an idea of the Mahdist mind. Mahdism, as a system, is organised on the Arabian model. That is to say, the leader is practically absolute in his decisions, and is at the same time the chief of the community in religious as well as secular affairs. His schools, youth movements, cotton-growing empire and political machine are all run from one enormous building where he also lives. When I was ushered into his presence, 10,000 drilled disciples stood below the balcony of the cream and green palace. Raising the spear and crescent moon emblem of the movement, Cheerleaders gave the blood-tingling call that once re-echoed over the battlefield at Omdurman. One God, Allah. One leader, the Mahdi. Syed Abdur Rahman started life in exile, providing for his mother by selling wood which he collected with his bare hands and sold from door to door. His personal fortune today is estimated at £6 million, and you can see in his face that he has tasted both the bitterness and pleasures of struggle. Knighted by the British, he was so respected by Egypt that he was granted a pashadam by Farouk. Syed Abdur Rahman, literally servant of the most merciful, is nearing 70, which is not young for a Sudanese. He spoke slowly, weighing his words, as we sipped coffee and listened to the cheers ringing out below. Inside the palace, electric fans, fluorescent strip lighting, All the appurtenances of modernity clash a little with the personality of the grave patriarch's appearance. 
but those who know him say that behind that otherworldly demure smile is one of the fastest thinking commercial brains in history. On the wall behind him hangs the Mahdi's sword, an heirloom taken centuries ago by one of his ancestors from a crusading German prince. If it were waved today before the endlessly marching hordes of Mahdi men, the country would be drenched with blood. His silken robes rustling, Sir Syed stood up to give me some idea of his plans. First, he said, we must have peace and welfare for the people. In the north, in places such as this, he waved his hand toward the orderly minarets of Khartoum beyond the window, there are few problems. Here we speak Arabic, dress in the same way, are expanding our cotton and agriculture. It is in the south, where they have no clothes, no education, no beliefs, that we must work to secure a united country. He said nothing for or against his main local opponent, the tiny, dynamic Sir Syed Magani Pasha, unless this could be taken as referring to him. When you have something to do, you must do it. It does not matter what other people say or think if you believe in your heart that you are right. Did our prophet worry about what the idolaters said when he had but one disciple? Did he run or fight when he was attacked and outnumbered by a hundred to one? Am I to model myself on any lesser man than that? Tantalizing glimpses of the Mahdi Empire at work were given me when I moved into the next house at the leader's invitation. Looming just opposite was the nerve centre of the organisation, the Daira Palace. Telephones were ringing from dawn to far into the night. White-robed clerks worked with an intensity that recalls the activity of ants. So many thousand bales of cotton from the Mahdi's own fields, so many hundred vehicles to carry exports to the ships at Port Sudan, so many books for the Mahdi scout leaders, a delegation to see about starting new industries, endlessly the machine whirs. In the blistering heat of the day, all through the fasting month of Ramadan, morning, noon and night it went on. Was I in New York or Chicago? Up the wide gravel pathways to the towering Daira's closely guarded gates, cars came in endless procession. Sir Abdur Rahman's right-hand man sweeps in for a conference with cotton buyers. Government officials, members of parliament, Religious leaders from a thousand miles up country fill the busy waiting halls where soft-footed servants carry sweet, thick, musbut coffee and pastries to the guests. It is all like one family in the Mahdi camp. Very often I found that a number of people working for the machine in various occupations were related. Syed Abdullahi, the present leader's brother-in-law, runs his own enormous import-export firm just a few blocks away, helped by an Oxford-educated son. Some of the key men in the departments of the organisation are sons of tribal and village chiefs upon whom Mahdism can rely to the death. Those who are accustomed to thinking analytically would be rather at a loss here. Is the Daira, is Mahdism itself, preponderantly religious, commercial, educational, military? It is all of these, and a bit more. It is a community so interrelated and tightly organised that it may be unique in human organisation. Membership of the Mahdi family in the Sudan almost always means that the person must work hard within the group. He may rise far towards the top. And as such, he is entitled to a tremendous amount of respect. Sir Syed was pleased when I told him that I planned to visit the tomb of his father across the river in Omdurman and to pay my respects to his memory. I obtained permission to photograph worshippers before the tomb and laid plans for getting pictures inside if there was any way that this could be managed. In Omdurman, the silver-domed edifice is guarded by two of the few survivors of the battle and they would be likely to disapprove of anyone who tried to snatch a picture of the interior the most hallowed ground to them outside Arabia's shrines.